For the last 20 years, Nationwide has been committed to working with fee-based financial professionals like you to help prepare your clients for every phase of their financial lives. They do this by delivering innovative solutions, services, and support designed to complement the way you do business. To learn more, visit nationwideadvisory.com. And thank you to Nationwide for sponsoring the Wealth Stack Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Wealth Stack Podcast. I'm Mark Bruno, the Managing Director of the Wealth Management Group at Informa Connect. And we are thrilled to have one of my favorite people in the wealth management community here on the podcast today. Delighted to have Jamie Hopkins, the Managing Partner of Wealth Solutions at Carson Wealth. Jamie, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Mark. And, uh, you know, I appreciate that uh, intro, but uh, always good to spend some time with you too. I know it's uh, you know, been been something we've gotten to do over the years, and I appreciate uh, you know bringing me on the show today. And I'm definitely looking forward to kind of going under the hood a bit here. We had you on the agenda for Wellstack back in September, and what we're trying to do with this podcast, Jamie, is make sure that you know one, we're talking about some of the most you know, important points you know in the wealth management business as it relates to advisors being able to grow their practices and provide a better experience to their clients. Uh, you, you know, at the at the time we were discussing the session for Wellstack, have done a lot of research just around the value of an advisor. Um, and we were going to go deep at the event on the value of advice, uh, how an advisor can actually go about articulating and gem- demonstrating what we were calling your true, quote, alpha, right? Um, and not in the sense, you know, the traditional sense, right, an asset management sense, but what makes you as an advisor different and more valuable, right, than any other advisor? Um, so I'm definitely looking forward to getting your thoughts there. Um, and I would just upfront, Jamie, maybe ask you to talk a little bit about your role at Carson first and how you're working directly with advisors to help them understand the best way to demonstrate their alpha. Yeah, thanks, Mark. And uh, you know, kind of where I've worked with helping advisors on their alphas changed a lot over time. You know, I spent uh, about seven years at American College running the retirement uh, division there and RICP designation and the Income Research Center. And, you know, part of what the you know, place like American College understands is that, you know, education, credentials, designations does help advisors position themselves better to clients as experts and does help them kind of distinguish in the market and add value from learning more. And, you know, I think that's where I started off was just this agnostic view that, well, I'll go teach everybody and then everyone will be better. And uh, part of my d- decision to go elsewhere and, and leave the college, because I love the college, but it was kind of about that. I, I ran into a person who had gone through a program and came back and said, hey, you have those slides from two years ago, you presented at this conference, and I, I really wanted to implement some of that. And I just kind of remember, uh, and, and all that should be positive, right? Here's somebody who's mm-hmm. gone through a program I created and saw me present twice and was asking for the slides. And it very much felt like a kick in the stomach because I realized that this person, even though having spent a lot of time around me from an education standpoint, hadn't actually implemented a lot of <laughs> that. <Right. laughs> so I realized that there was still this gap from education to implementation. And so I kind of went out to the world to try to find a place uh, that would implement more of this. And I found Carson and stepped in really just in the retirement division when I came in, trying to implement best practices from advisors and the client experience side. And I've shifted around a little bit in three years there. I've moved to started to running the coaching company and we work with about 1400 advisory firms at any given time. And then uh, took over, yeah, whatever the title is now, managing partner of Wealth Solutions, and th- that's a little bit broader now. And kind of my responsibilities and roles in helping all of the firms that work with us, you know, kind of deliver on that planning promise. And how do we demonstrate that to clients? So not just. You know, it, you know, I think a lot of advisors do a great job at what they do. A lot of advisors still struggle to actually articulate their voice, their value proposition over in a way that's, uh, you know, decentralized from just investment returns. So many people spend the annual review meeting kind of going on that. But then either, you know, which the last 10 years hasn't been so bad, but you kind of get mm-hmm. beat up or, or win off of their returns. And I do think as we move to this more planning oriented approach, especially in the RIA world, 
that, you know, how do we demonstrate alpha as you brought up before? How do we demonstrate value? So the client actually perceives what they're getting back is worth it. And that's often where most purchases, exchanges, services, relationships come down to is the perception of value uh, has to be very key to it. Is there an experience and a perception that align so that I'm happy with the decision that I made to work with you as an advisor? I appreciate that. It sets the table nicely for what I think is a broad, but also a very important conversation for us to maybe highlight some specific thoughts and strategies for advisors to not just articulate, right? Because it's not just about you know, showing you know, how or where you're adding value, but you know, for them to truly differentiate, right? Um, and to deliver maybe a client experience, whether it's through technology or other ways, right? That is truly unique and completely different from others in the space. So maybe if we just start at the beginning of the conversation, Jamie, around you know, the value of advice or the value of an advisor, let's put investment performance to the side, right? Say all things being equal, um, there are two advisors that are you know, very similar in terms of how they manage money um, and what the results have been. What are some of the other characteristics, returns out uh, aside, that are most important to clients and are also providing the most direct value as they perceive their advisor. Yeah, it, there, there's a really interesting one where you can argue that tax planning and whatever tax alpha you can generate for client might be the most important one. If you look at how people just feel around taxes, which is where a lot of this comes down, if you save, uh, I saw some something on this, which was like, you know, basically if you save a client, you know, a thousand dollars in taxes, it's worth 10 X that in investment returns, um, mm -hmm. from the client's perspective, you know, they just don't like paying taxes. So, uh, that's most people. So if you come in and say, Hey, here's a way that we saved you money in taxes, it comes off as, you know, true value add, because I think a lot of people look at that as, you know, I wouldn't have gotten that unless I was working with you. Right. If I had done it myself, I probably would have missed it. And I, th I think we recognize that. I, I think, even, you know, more sophisticated individuals recognize that the tax world can be complex and just constantly thinking about how to add value there uh, is very hard. And technology is getting better there. You know, tax prep and filing has been one of the areas I do think that technology from an experience point got really good for the 80%, you know, the turbo tax and Lacerts and other things out there, you know, are really good systems. And if you're just, you know, fairly standard filer moving forward, that part is done well. The big difference between all the technology and, you know, kind of advisor value there is none of those really engage in any type of pre-planning or moving forward, which I find so yeah. interesting because they, they gather all this data. They've got this seamless, uh, you know, transition and client stickiness, but there's really no planning going on, right? We just are, you know, looking backwards in the tax world. And that's a lot of CPA firms too. So where advisors can come in is, you know, reviewing previous returns and then figuring out what were areas we could have improved upon upon moving forward. And so it's just changing the view as opposed to, you know, living in a world where we were doing filings to how do we do planning? And there's technology that's developing there too, whether it's Holista Plan, FP Alpha, there's a couple others out there that are making that easier for advisors. I think today you brought up, you know, what differentiates, I think being a really good tax, you know, adding tax planning into your practice is a differentiator. I will tell you that my belief is within five years, and I actually think it'll be faster. I think it might be three years and it's a little bit, you know, I guess, uh, pushing the envelope, but I think within three to five years, that's going to be fairly standard. A lot of things that differentiate you, right? Three to five years earlier become more standard practice. And mm -hmm. that's one of them. I just think where I see the technology on that side, where it is today and the adoption rates of some of those, it's moving so fast that I can't see how that'll even be a differentiator in five years, but it is today. And I would rather be on the front end of that <laughs> than on right. the back end of that. So if you're looking at that, I mean, over the next three to five years, I think that's something if you don't have it in your practice today, you need to, you need to add it because, you know, if you're going around and you're saying, Hey, I'm working with this client and somebody else comes in and finds them 10 grand worth of tax savings. Remember that's like a hundred grand worth of investment returns. They just generated that client. Honestly, you probably didn't generate them a hundred grand of additional investment returns the last year. Sure. So you might lose that client. And I think that's one of those areas where you can win business today and will be able to over the next couple of years. And then I, I think we'll see such a, such a change in that, that it'll become kind of standard practice to have the technology at least and, and be offering it. 
Yeah, I can certainly appreciate that, right? Especially when you look at, you know, on the tax planning side, like investment performance, it's tangible, right? And to some extent, it's also short term. Um, you know, I can actually see the money that you've saved me, right, over the course of, you know, a single you know, tax year, for instance. Um, but what if we were you know, looking into the future a bit, let's say three years out, um, the tax planning piece is table stakes, right? Arguably, just like the investment management piece is. What do you think some of the more intangible you know, uh, deliverables or services are that advisors you know, can provide to clients to demonstrate their value? And I'll just I'll, I'll caveat that. Right. Um, I, I ask because most of what advisors are helping clients with is very long term. Right. Retirement planning and outcomes that they may not necessarily be able to evaluate for 10, 15, 20 years. So what are some of the things that I can do between you know, now and then as an advisor to, to intangibly you know, demonstrate and reinforce the value of the advice I'm delivering? Yeah, I'll give you one concrete example of something that we added to our client experience. And then I'll give kind of a, a funny aside around this is somebody, you know, I, I'm an attorney by trade and somebody told me once they go, you know, it's actually really hard to get a good estate planning referrals because if you find out the estate plan was really good, the client's gone. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, it, it's similar to a lot of the long-term planning that you engage with an advisor on, right? Like, how do we know if that advisor has really created a great retirement plan? We won't mm -hmm. know until later in retirement, right? We, we actually don't know. And so part of it is, you know, are, we can obviously test things, right? It's not like we have zero idea, but we don't fully know how that's going to turn out versus a different strategy for maybe 30 or 40 years. So a lot of it is, you know, instilling confidence and a belief and as much as you possibly can demonstrate through math and performance indicators that it is a good plan. Now, I think demonstrating these things are important and some of it can just be past documentation and visualization. So one of the things we added to our ecosystem at Carson maybe two and a half years ago now is something, uh, it's basically a timeline. It's called Life's Moments. And what we did is we took all the planning that kind of went into notes. So if you said, hey, Hey, we helped fund this 529. We helped this kid refinance. We bought this, uh, you know, help with this uh, purchase of the car, right? We did all these different things for the client and their family and kids. And you probably did have notes about this. Now, depending on how your system set up, your notes might have been on paper and a yellow pad 10 years ago. But if you actually do have documentation and clean data, we can actually take all those planning points and put them into a timeline so the client can actually see the history of the relationship and the true planning things that were done and activity versus just investment and allocation, risk time tolerance and product. So it really does get you away from that. And mm. if you if you are truly doing planning, you are doing a lot of things. You're just not always getting credit for them because in three years, does anyone go back and are you going to really bring up, oh yeah, we helped refinance three years ago. And that's why I'm valuable to have around. You're probably not going to bring that up. But in, in our life's moment, you can the client can visualize that. So as part of the client reviews, that's part of it, right? And it shows all the different planning pieces that were done. And then advisors have that ability, right? You can go in, delete things, add things if they weren't pulled in correctly from the notes, things like that. So you can actually develop that experience. But I think that's important. Uh, we've seen that, you know, from clients, just, you know, how much they appreciate that being able to see the kind of a better full impact of the relationship over time. So I think any way you can do that as an advisor, I mean, that's one way to do it. It's not saying that's mm -hmm. the only way. It's the way that Carson's decided to do it, but it requires clean data. And a lot of people don't have good data. If you don't have good data, you probably aren't going to be able to do that. <laughs> uh, yep. Maybe you could do it moving forward. Uh, but I think figure out how you're going to demonstrate all that work that you've done for them that you don't necessarily get credit for each and every year, but those do have long-term impacts, right? The decision to refinance or pay off this or pay off that does have implications on your retirement plan. But, you know, once those are kind of those activities are complete, you usually just move on and that's it. And people forget that, oh, you did these things and helped us make decisions that were different than we otherwise would have. Appreciate that. And I remember actually years ago, I was doing a, a research project where you know, we were surveying and also interviewing both advisors and investors to just kind of compare and contrast what they valued versus what they thought was valuable. Um, and I remember just in one of the interviews, um, it, in, an investor um, who was working with an advisor had a great relationship, loved the, the advisor. When we asked, you know, 
what is it that you value the most? Um, his response was, my advisor saves me from making mistakes that I would have made you know, on my own. Um, and it was just so simple, right? And the way you've just articulated sort of these life choices that you have to navigate and being able to show what you helped with, right? Um, how you helped them get from point A to point B, even if we're not at point Z yet, those little things can go a very long way. And in the end, that's the difference between, you know, a service and a relationship, I suppose, right? Yeah, I think it's a service relationship. And then I think the next piece is how do we get to an experience too, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, that's terminology that gets thrown around. I don't know. We know all what it means in an advisory <laughs> relationship yet, but you know, what I, I do look out as I see the stuff that is working well out there in the world. Right. And this is not based off a of country or years, right. We know that people pay for experiences, right. And they're yep. okay doing that. And that can supersede, right. The relationship and the service and the deliverable, but is an experience that you enjoy and that will, will, that will be willing to stick with that and pay up for it. You know, Disney's done a great example, right. Of just creating that full experience at Disney. And I think they've done that to when it relates to uh, even the Marvel Universe world that they've created is this whole experience from right food and action figures, TV, movies that has now spanned, you know, 15 years that people are continuing to watch from comic books, which comic books were much more of a like an interaction with a product, right? They weren't really a true experience. And Disney's really been able to take that and, and fundamentally change it. And it's uh, it is a really interesting thing, right? They didn't create any new ideas, right? They right. didn't they didn't do anything new. <laughs> they just took stuff that was already created and out there in the world that you could have just read <laughs> and yeah. created a whole experience around it. And it's it's fundamentally changed. Uh, you know, obviously they've made more money in the movies than I think I was looking at something, you know, Stan Lee had like a net worth of $20 million or something, right? Like created all this and Robert Downey Jr. gets paid like 30 million dollars a movie <laughs> and you're like okay right. so they created something different here they they took existing <laughs> things they packaged it together and it's different and i i'm not saying that we're going to create the marvel universe for a, advice and planning but we're not a great experience i think a lot of you know even when i i drive by offices or virtual setups i think there's minor things that advisors are going to start realizing that this is a whole experience from the way i set up my zoom and not having half my head head cut off and, you know, things like that. Um, I mean, they're small, but they're all part of the experience. Right. And when I, when I see that sometimes I'm like, ah, like, don't they know that that just doesn't look good. Right. I can only see half your face, like just fix your camera. And there's small things like that as we move into the future that advisors are going to have to think about. Some advisors do, uh, you know, and they think about, you know, what's the entryway look like? What's their color palette look like? What, you know, how do they look on screen? How do they sound? And investing into all of those small things to increase the client experience because they all matter, right? It's not just one of those matter. They all add up to, to that experience. And I, you know, I think that's, that's probably the next, you know, a next big thing. I, I know a couple of people, you know, Dana Onspach has done a great job at that out there in the world, like thinking about sure. color palette and how I look and hiring people to design the whole office. Some people do that, some don't. Some people hire people to, you know, do their virtual setup and how they're going to look. Some don't, but it's all just investing back into the business and really enhancing the client experience. It's, uh, it's always fun when you can transition from tax planning to Marvel to color palettes in the same conversation. Jamie, thank you for keeping me <laughs> on my toes here. But I do actually want to ask a little bit about, you know, you mentioned the video piece and the way we communicate. Um, you know, this isn't necessarily specific to advice broadly, but more specific to your experience. And I'm curious, um, I've known you for a while. We've seen each other at conferences for a while, um, but I feel like once the pandemic hit in March of last year, um, you really just sort of floored it um, with the way you used video, social, um, and you did it in an appropriate way. I didn't feel like I was overdosing on you. I felt like I actually got to see you more, right? Um, and I felt like I had, you know, more of a direct connection with you, you know, over the, say, the three to six months, right, um, after the pandemic hit, than I would have had in an ordinary cycle. Um, so I'm curious, I mean, how did that translate for you personally, um, did you have others reaching out to you with a similar experience? And what was sort of the net result of the way you communicated with the advice community? Yeah, so I would say that the way I kind of structured my life and the way I work has changed a lot. And I still have, 
I don't know if anxiety is the best word, but I have kind of anxiety or, you know, some fear of missing out on the way I used to do things. You know, I, I used to write a lot and I would write a couple articles a week. I mean, in 2019, I published over a hundred and something articles. And so I was writing something almost every day, right? At least working on something to get it out. And I don't write that much right now. And it's not because I don't love writing, but I shifted things. So we have yeah. a podcast and then I started doing those Monday videos with the, the cards that I write on a blank sheet of white paper. I've used the iPad too. I've used a chalkboard. I've tried all different things on that. And uh, those, those kind of found to be the medium that works well. And I have had similar responses to people about that. Just, you know, all of a sudden I showed up with these cards and I do these two minute videos on a whole bunch of different topics. Like you said, from color palettes to Marvel to, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, tax yep. planning. And uh, I actually had the, the, the president of Allianz. I saw him just randomly at a conference last week and he came up and he goes, oh, Jamie, I didn't even know the guy knew who I was, right? I've never met him in right. my life. And he comes up and goes, oh, I love one of your videos from like two weeks ago. I actually used it in our national sales retreat um, for all of our like, sales people and i was like oh like that's cool like you know uh <laughs> wasn't my intended target right but yeah. like it's just an interesting thing and then we even had a, a one of our advisors you know send me an email i mean maybe i think this was in 2020 and they, they go what well, you know how'd you find us you know they this client came to them a prospect and then became a client and the client was like oh i started following this guy on youtube and uh, LinkedIn that posts these little videos with these cards. And I went to the website and found an advisor that was you, that was my local one and, you know, joined because of that. And uh, so it's kind of this interesting thing like, that, you know, those are two people that use stuff out of it that I had never mm -hmm. interacted with, but probably felt some connection to me, <laughs> right? Yeah. But did it, like didn't know that, you know, uh, didn't know that they, you know, to be honest, watched anything. I, I don't think because people watch stuff and then don't always interact on them too. And so you don't really know who is watching versus engaging. And it is a very interesting thing. And, you know, the pandemic was interesting in that sense of it, it took stuff from us, right? Like it kind of took my writing away from me because I used to write on planes and traveling and my day was just structured to manage that. And what it gave me was more, you know, it gave me a podcast framework. It gave me video content. Uh, it gave me more time at home for a while, but uh, that's kind of gone for me again. I've been back on the road and now I'm trying to figure out how I readjust, but it was a big change, right? I essentially moved from writing to video content and I'm not sure I'll go back to it. Uh, hmm. You know, and that's kind of the question. That's, that's where that anxiety comes from, right? Like, should I be writing or shooting videos? And there's a balance and then the answer should be, you should be doing both, but there's only so much time in the day. <laughs> That is the truth. The answer is always you should be doing both or you should be doing more, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but when you crack the code and figure out the balance, please let me know. But I, I definitely, you know, hear what you're saying, especially, you know, around multimedia, it tends to be a multiplier, right? And a way for people to feel like they know you before they meet you. Um, and I'm glad that you're having that experience. I hope a lot of advisors have actually learned from that. Um, and I think you also, you didn't mention, but you've done a fair amount of your video content that is personal too, not too personal. But um, I remember the first time you were back on the road, you know, seeing a video of you on LinkedIn where you were in an airport um, and you just kind of panned out and showed that there were 10 other people in the airport too, yeah. <laughs> um, right? Yeah. Um, yeah but it was one of those things that kind of brought me into your experience a bit. So I hope that there are you know, other advisors that are you know taking notes and realizing that there's a balance between you know personal and professional, obviously, and how you can engage with people. Yeah. And everything, you know, and, and that's a great point, right? At, when I was at Excel, we had a thousand people out in Vegas in October for a conference, which is that hard decision, right? Do you run something? Do you yep. not run it? And we so it. we, yep. <laughs> so <laughs> we're in here talking about the one we didn't run, but are still going to run, right? <laughs> And, you know, I, my interviews there, I, I did a bunch of interviews, but it was all just, you know, what does community mean to you, right? I, I wasn't trying to teach anybody anything, but just, you know, we're back together to some degree. Not everybody was, but, uh, you know, just sharing that aspect of things. And I try not to post a lot of like children's stuff, even though some people do. And that's, well, people love seeing your family and stuff. My my wife's an attorney and she's not a, she's, she's more in the mindset that she would like our kids to be able to decide their own kind of 
of online future as much as they can. And uh, so I've, I've kind of adhered to that, but like me personally, I would be put, my kids are adorable and I would put them up all the time if I could, but uh, you know, I, there is a balance and it's interesting, you know, being home, like, you know, I, when you see the videos of me, most of the time I'm in my office, which is my, you know, was, uh, you know, I guess a traditionally a guest bedroom in my house and then became my office with, the pandemic. And uh, so you are kind of inviting people into your home when you shoot videos like that, which is different. You know, there's a lot of people that never, if I said, Hey, show me a video of your home and they'd be like, no. And now we kind of freely do it. <laughs> and, you know, it's uh, it is a big change and there is some personal aspect of things. But if you look at a lot of advisor websites and, and the content that does the best on them, a lot of times for advisors, it's blogs that they write about, right? Oh, you know, what I learned, you know, what I learned about, you know, uh, budgeting on our family trip to Disney since we brought up Disney. Like that's the stuff that actually does the best. As mm -hmm. much as you can share a little bit, it doesn't mean you need to give every detail of your family life and personal life, but, you know, show that you're a human people connect better to that. It's the old saying too, right? We, people follow people, not, you know, companies. So people follow Elon Musk more than anyone else. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's who they follow uh, versus the company. And you can kind of go across the board. And that tends to be the case that a lot of the founders are followed more than the actual company itself from a, you know, branding, et cetera, perspective. So I think that's true for the advisory world too. If you want to connect better, some degree of, of you know, human nature makes sense. And Ron actually built his firm on passion prospecting, which is, uh, you know, very, personal, right? It's like, what do we care yep. about? And, you know, he used to go, I think he told me on Valentine's day, he used to go and like pick up candy and like cards for all of his clients and drive them to everybody's house. And, uh, you know, like I think about that, I'm like, you know, that is a lot of caring, right? Like driving up to somebody's house, knocking on the door, brought you candy <laughs> or yeah. whatever, or whatever else they liked, you know, <laughs> not everyone ate candy. I think he said, sometimes he'd bring people tomatoes and stuff from his family's garden. And, you know, it, like, you think about that. I mean, that was ultra personal, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I don't think a lot of advisors are probably doing that. We might send stuff out now, but uh, to me, like there is something cool that, you know, you were close enough to drive up to people's houses and bring them, you know, bring them stuff, uh, you know, tomatoes from your family garden during the year. That's very cool. Um, and I, I do just have one final question here for you. Um, you know, as we've talked about the value of advice, I feel like we tend to talk about things at very macro levels, um, but you know, it, often it helps me when I'm thinking about you know, whether it's doing a presentation or a podcast, um, you know, how do we sort of break the various types of client and pros prospect segments out? Um, and I, I'm curious if you look at clients that are under the age of 45, right? Specifically, um, are there, I mean, you've obviously spent a tremendous amount of time in your career focused on retirement planning, right? And clearly that speaks directly to the boomer population. But I'm curious if you've seen any major differences in what a client that's under 45 values relative to a client that is over the age of 45. Yeah, I'm not. I'll, I'll be blunt on this first part. I'm not the best at that because one thing you brought up, I I spent so much of my time, like all my research, looked at 55 and over for mm -hmm. 12 years. <laughs> so, yep. Uh, and it, it is. It honestly wasn't until probably the last two years that I started spending more time just holistically across the board, looking at um, not just under 45, but you know, there's very big differences in the 18 to 25 range right yep. now from behavior and then on up, and, and they do change. The only thing that's always hard about this is how do they change over time, though, as life moments start to occur? So there are differences. But when you start equalizing for other things like, you know, we're like, oh, the 45 year old is different than the 45 year old 20 years ago. The answer is yes. Mm. However, are they just eight years different in their life cycle? Then how do we deal with that? Right. They bought their first home at 36. OK, so they're a little bit different than the couple that bought their home at 25 four and had kids at 25, we have a 35 year old that bought a house with kids. And so the 45 behavior should be different because um, age is, you know, not necessarily the best driver of anything, right? It's just, you know, it's a number we can, you know, see and measure, but it's probably better to look at where they are in their, their life. Now, I would say uh, one interesting thing, and this has been, you know, not that robo advice and automated platforms haven't done well, 
but they haven't done anywhere near what people thought they were going to do. If you go yep. back to like 2010, I mean, you probably remember writing stories back then yeah, <laughs> and absolutely. being like, it's, it's just going to take over. That's going to, if we <laughs> say by 2020, like this is basically going to end. And like we fast forward 11 years and it really had no meaningful impact on the rest of the market. Right. I mean, there's a couple nicely valued companies, but market wise it's had, I mean, ne- I mean, I would say basically zero impact on the total market, right? I mean, probably less than some, less than 1%, right? Uh, Which is pretty tiny. And kind of what we found out was that even though a lot of people started to enjoy a better technology experience, and they do come to expect that, when we look at 45-year-olds even today, we see in 40-year-olds and late 30-year-olds that they want that mix of technology in a person. Um, now, that is different than maybe a 75-year-old and 70-year-old that really doesn't care about the technology piece. Um, so there's that difference. But we still haven't gotten that like native technology person who grew up with this experience and only wants that um, from especially advisory doctor attorney relationships they still want this mix which I think is very interesting so we haven't seen that kind of dynamic shift I I do believe that we're going to just see behavioral changes that are based off of other things in life that you know people carry more student loan debt I don't think anybody's figure out all the implications of that yet but you know whether it's impacting risk taking one way or another starting new careers and jobs once you have this fixed expense i mean behavioral finance would tell us that that does impact a bunch of different risks that we can take right our risk capacity has been changed from an early age and that obviously then changes what people are looking for uh I do think that alts and different investment options, even though I don't have the data to support this besides the fact of just purchasing and who's buying what, there's clearly a inclination towards right cryptocurrency, towards single company stocks again mm-hmm. versus diversification at younger ages. And that's all popped up. And I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing yet. I mean, you can have people argue on both sides there. Uh, about whether that's a good thing because we're getting more and more people experienced to the markets or is it a bad thing because there's an expectation where we've just been in a complete upswing in the market for 11 years. So nobody remembers 2008 anymore if you hopped in in the last 10 years. And uh, you know that'll be a tough learning experience. So there's big changes, but yeah, I don't spend a lot of time kind of deviating or differentiating between those. We, I try to think of things as holistic markets and just where the market is going in general. So you do spend more time now thinking about what does a 30-year-old want? Because if we're going to build a 100-year company, it means we need to serve them for the next 50, 60 years. And so less concerned about trying to solve for what the 72-year-old wants, um, but kind of recognizing how people's you know desires, wants, and you know wishes change over life is also important that you can't expect that when people, I think that's one downside of looking at what 30 year olds want today and then saying, I'm going to build a business around that because it will be different in five to 10 years um, than what it is today. Very true. And I think yeah, there are very few people who can cover as much ground as you have here on this podcast. I was, I was kind of waiting for a Thanos reference to the robo advisors circa <laughs> 2010, um, but we didn't get I, there. So yeah, <laughs> I, I, I am inevitable, right? I mean, that's the reference, right? <laughs> I appreciate that. And I appreciate you taking the time to, to stop by and do the podcast. Um, and I'm also very much looking forward to, and I'm glad to hear that Excel conference was a success. Um, we also recently announced our dates for the new Wellstack event. Um, which will be May 31st through June 3rd, 2022 at the Diplomat floor. So we are very much looking forward to getting back out there as well and for having you in the mix in 2022. So Jamie, thank you so much for stopping by. We appreciate it. Well, thanks, Mark. And yeah, if people haven't been to the Diplomat Hotel, that's a nice hotel too. So it's uh, it's a good one if you're going to go spend an extra day somewhere at, you know, go to the conference and book an extra night. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. And I haven't been to a hotel and actually... A little over a year and a half at this point. So I think anywhere sounds <laughs> <laughs> nice these days, but I am absolutely looking forward to that one. So Jamie, thank you again for stopping by. I appreciate it. And thank you to everybody for tuning in to this episode of the Wealth Stack podcast. Like I said, we've covered a lot of ground here, um, but we will be going a little bit deeper you know, in future episodes of the Wealth Stack podcast on 
obviously the value of advice, but the role that technology can play in helping to accelerate the growth of your business. So on behalf of the wealth management team, I'm Mark Bruno. Uh, thank you so much for dropping by. And thank you again, Jamie, for, for being here on the podcast. And we look forward to having everybody back soon. For the last 20 years, Nationwide has been committed to working with fee-based financial professionals like you to help prepare your clients for every phase of their financial lives. They do this by delivering innovative solutions, services, and support designed to complement the way you do business. To learn more, visit nationwideadvisory.com. And thank you to Nationwide for sponsoring the WealthStack podcast.